Hi, it's Craig Wilson here, and welcome to the latest episode of the Making the Media podcast. Great to have you join us for our latest dive behind the scenes of the news and media entertainment industry, and we have a fantastic guest for you. Ros Atkins is best known as a presenter for the BBC, the creator of the innovative news show Outside Source, and the creator of the viral Ros Atkins On series of explainer videos. Now, if you haven't seen them, they are definitely worth checking out. He has been dubbed the UK's explainer-in-chief by some, known for in-depth but accessible videos on major news stories and events. And now he's taken time to write a book called The Art of Explanation, where he sets out his techniques on how to deliver information with clarity and confidence. We had a very wide-ranging discussion and we'll come on to outside source, dealing with news avoidance, assertive impartiality, his explainer videos and more shortly. But I began by asking him why he felt the need to write a book about explanation. When I started to think about, well, how do you explain yourself clearly? And it's a question I've been wrestling with all the way back to my degree in history, to be honest, and how you take on complex stories and issues in history and, and explain them in, a, in an essay. But of course, I've carried on doing that as a journalist. And as I've gone through the last 30 years, I've developed a system that I use to try and take on explanation, in particular, complex explanation. And at first, I really saw that as something that was underpinning my work as a journalist. And, and it does. And that's the first and foremost thing I use it for. But I also started to notice, especially in the last 10 years, that the system I was using to help myself explain explain myself in, in, in the work context as a journalist or prior to that as a student could also help me in a range of different ways away from those responsibilities. Maybe it was going for a job interview. Maybe it was trying to make the case for, a, for an idea I was trying to get off the ground or whatever the example might be. So suddenly I started to see explanation as being something that really could help me in a whole range of different interactions in my life. And that felt like a uh, an interesting area to explore. And then what's happened in the last few years is that our explainer videos have to our, uh, you know, it's been a very nice surprise to see them become more and more popular. And quite often, both me and the brilliant producers I work with get asked, well, how do you make them? And in the process of answering those questions, I'd quite often allude to the fact that I've got this system that I use to work through how I kind of gather and distill and structure and explain information. And people seemed interested in it. And I thought, well, possibly that's a book idea. Possibly if I could put all of that in one place, I could write a book that I hope is useful for journalists, but actually is a book that could be useful to all of us. Because whatever line of work we do, whatever stage of life we're at, Every day we are interacting with people. Every day we are offering information and we're asking for information and actions in return. And I guess in some ways the book is me saying, if we can be a bit more conscious, if, if we can be conscious of how we go about those day-to-day -day moments and the big moments in our lives too, the, the impact can be, can be reasonably transformative. One of the things that you mentioned there was about simplicity. And it's interesting in the book because simplicity is not about avoiding the complex. No. But trying to explain the complex. And I thought that was a really interesting part of it. Um, yeah. So the, well. the idea that that being simple is a very good way of communicating, and needless to say, I'm not the first person to to point that out. The the thing I tried to get across, and I'm delighted that you spotted it, is that simple doesn't necessarily mean short. It's being communicating an issue in the simplest form doesn't mean that it has to be in 30 seconds. It might mean you need to take an hour over it if it's a huge subject or whatever the case may be. Maybe you need 10,000 words. I've just uh, written a book that's in the region of 80,000 words, but I hope that as I go through all the different things within the book that I have found the simplest way of sharing that information with the reader. So yes, simplicity is vital. If we can use, uh, if we can share information in the simplest form, it gives us a better chance of it being understood and consumed and acted on. But you're right, we mustn't mistake a desire to, to find simplicity with a desire to just chuck out all the detail, because sometimes it's the detail that people really need. Yeah, another phrase you use is high protein news. Yes. Which I liked within the, within the book as well. Explain what you mean by that. So 
I started talking about high protein news because it struck me, and this will be familiar to you and I'm sure anyone listening to this, that there is ever more information flying at us, whether it's a good or a bad thing, it's it's reality. There's information swirling all around us, infinite amounts of it coming at us from a range of different sources. And as a consequence, there's huge pressure if we are trying to communicate effectively on saying to people, the information I've got for you is worth you giving my time. And, and the calculation when I was, when we were making outside source, and then when we started making the explainer videos as well was, well, look, I'm aware you've got a lot of options. You could watch outside source. You could watch one of my videos, or quite frankly, you could opt to do 101 other things instead. And I was making the calculation, well, if you are going to choose to listen to me, I'm going to I'm going to make sure that for every minute you do, you get a, you get a lot in return. And that's what I meant by high protein news. I sometimes felt that when I was both consuming the news in lots of different places and also when I'm being communicated with in a range of different ways, I sometimes think I am interested in this subject, but I'm not sure I'm getting enough per minute to really stick with this. And I didn't want people to feel like that when they were either reading my book or watching me do the news. So high protein is not about rushing. It's not about rattling through things as fast as you can. It's not about just chucking as much dense detail into every minute that it becomes completely inconsumable. It's about finding ways of being simple and being clear and being engaging and being consumable. But while doing all of those things, guaranteeing that you are giving people a decent return on the time they're investing on listening in, in listening to you. Yeah, one of the things that when I worked in newspapers, I was interested in page design and I read Harold Evans' book. And one of the things that Evans talked about was the use of white space and the effective use of white space in, in, in newspaper design, which I thought was really interesting because I often feel within sort of television context and other things, people try and fill the white space. They try and they, they, they feel that they have a need to kind of fill the time available as opposed to actually focusing on. And is that something that you see that people try and pad things out and actually need to focus much more on the detail and the essential elements of what they're trying to convey? So it's interesting you highlight the, the idea of white space. I, li I like that thought a lot. I suppose what I think about when I'm approaching an explanation is if I can distill the information I've got First of all, can I identify the essential information and, and get rid of information that's you know not irrelevant, but not necessarily essential to understanding whatever I'm explaining? Can I distill it? And then also, can I get that information and the language I use around it in its simplest form? Because if you can do those two things, you create what you're calling white space, or in broadcasting, it might just be a bit of breathing room. What, what I'm not trying to say is that every last article or written piece of explanation or you know, every presentation or speech or whatever the case may be, idea pitch, is just rammed full, you know, indigestible. What I'm saying is that actually you can create space, you can create white space, you can create breathing room to make what you're saying consumable without necessarily compromising on the detail. And the way that you do that is to make sure that you're reasonably ruthless about distilling the information down and getting rid of unnecessary words, unnecessary additional information around that. And, you know, I think in the book, I reference a, a famous Steve Jobs story from when he was developing, I think it was the, I can't remember if it's the iPod or the iPhone off the top of my head, but, but either way, the story still holds. And a designer came in and said, I just can't, we can't get it any smaller. This is as small as we can get it. And Steve Jobs drops it, drops the, let's say it's the iPhone. I can't remember which one it was, the iPhone into a fish tank. And there, and he says, there are bubbles in there. And his point was, there's still space. And I like that idea because when I'm often wrestling with a script at work and I'll think, I just feel like it's a bit rushed. It's all a bit packed in. My first instinct isn't just to remove a section, though I might have to do that. My first instinct is to go back to the language that I've used and see, actually, are there simpler ways of doing this? Are there pieces of information that I don't need? And almost always there are. And that way you can create space in a confined area without actually losing the, the core, the most essential information of what you're trying to get across. 
You, you mentioned earlier on, um, Ross, about the explainer videos that you do, and they can take a complex subject and explain it perhaps in, in three minutes, but perhaps in six, seven, eight minutes, depending on, on, on what it is. Do you think part of that is also, I think a number of years ago, there was a view that, you know, everything's going to be 35, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, and those people will switch off. But in reality, the audience deserves a bit more credence and people are interested in detail. They are interested in understanding the context of where a story comes from. Yeah, I think there's something in that. I suppose I would say that both of the things you're saying are true. There are certain video platforms and there are certain consumers who do want things very, very quickly. And you can't ignore the fact that in digital video, for example, the first few seconds of your video are really quite important to deciding the success or otherwise of whether people will watch. So there are definitely times when making a really short video is the best way of engaging people on a on a subject. And of course, there's lots of evidence of that from Twitter to, uh, to LinkedIn to TikTok in particular and any number of other platforms. However, I think what I was trying to explore with our explainer videos was that while it is definitely true that short video in some circumstances is the way to go, that there is also a market for longer explanation where we take more time than might be available in more classic forms of journalism to provide the context, provide the historical background, to provide the extra data and evidence that you might need to fully unpack a subject. And I think there are a number of examples. Uh, newsletters is one. Podcasts is another. Uh, any number of different video formats on YouTube is another. There are examples on the TV as well, of course, where people will watch for longer because they do want that extra information. And that's really a space that I'm trying to explore. I don't think, though, that it disproves that in some situations people do want really short, focused, snackable video. I think the reality is that both of those, both of those formats, both durations, both the very short, the medium length, which I guess is the arena I'm in, and much longer programming too, can all find audiences when they're done well. You, you talk in the book about the kind of concept behind outside source and, and how, why you felt that that was sort of necessary to try to, to try to do that. Maybe talk a little bit about that and how that differed from the constraints of a traditional news bulletin. Right. So back in the late 2000s, the noughties, as I think we call them, I was primarily a, a radio news presenter for BBC World Service, but I'd started to do some regular TV bulletin presenting for BBC World News, the 24-hour the TV network outside the UK. And I'd noticed while doing this that we were really quite constrained in terms of how quickly we could get a lot of information that was swirling around, in particular a breaking story, onto the TV. And it wasn't a criticism, I hasten to add, of any of my fantastic colleagues. We just didn't have the technology to easily translate that content, whether it was a tweet or uh, a new statement that had been put out on uh, you know, Facebook or whatever the example might be, onto the TV. And I thought, well, that's an opportunity because, well, it's also potentially a problem because if people can pick up their phone and get lots of right up to date information, but they don't see it on the TV, then they might not see us as the most useful source. But I also thought it was an opportunity because I was excited to see, is there some fantastic technologists at the BBC? Can we build something that allows us to more quickly translate content that's passing through the digital arena when a story is developing and get it onto the TV? And to cut a long story short, um, the BBC decided to, to make a programme which ended up being called Outside Source. And the, the brilliant engineers here and designers and directors and producers all worked on, well, how do we solve this problem? And the, the solution we came up to originally was a touchscreen that the producers could feed digital content into and a range of other content too, I hasten to add. And then I would be able to select it from the touchscreen and show it on the TV. And how I described it at the time, and I think it's still a good description, was it was the broadcast equivalent of a live page. If you think of a live page that's run by lots of news organizations, the BBC does plenty of them. Normally, there's one or two or three people who are hosting the live page, and they're pulling in all sorts of different content 
both from their own organization and outside as well, if they think it's useful. And they're writing around it. So they're guiding the audience through the story and collating the information. And I was quite taken by the idea of me as the presenter being the person doing the collation. And the touchscreen was the tool that allowed me to do that. And then the brilliant producers behind the scenes were the ones who were picking out the information as the story developed, feeding it into the screen. And then it was my job to weave it together. And so and so that was the idea. And, and the, the, the rewarding part of the equation was having spent quite a long time developing this idea and uh, a lot of time, as you could imagine, on the technology of both uh, building how the touchscreen would work, building how the producers could get content into the touchscreen, working out how that interacted with the directors and the gallery, because they were very much integral to how that touchscreen worked. There were lots of different dimensions to it. So it was a, a kind of fantastic team experience across the BBC. And then we went on air. And when stories broke, we were able to get stuff on air to show our audience stuff that we were getting much, much more quickly than we had been able to previously. And so that was a nice, that was a rewarding moment to, to kind of go from us collectively spotting an obstacle and finding a both presentation and technical and production route through it. In, in telling stories in a different way, whether it's with outside source or whether it's with the explainer videos, do you think in some ways you're trying to address what, what some people would refer to as news avoidance, where people have in their heads that either the agenda is grim or that the way that programmes are told and stories are told turns people off, and you're trying to do things in a slightly different, more appealing way to them? So that's an interesting question. I suppose the, 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 the first group I had in mind when I was thinking about the explainer videos were people who were already aware of a story, but were also perhaps feeling a little overwhelmed, understandably, because we often, we all often feel this way, by the volume of information and issues and claims and counterclaims swirling around that story or issue. And I imagine the, the videos being a product that could help in that situation. So I wasn't arriving going, you've never heard of this story, you really need to pay attention. There's nothing wrong with that. that. There's plenty of stories where that applies, but that's not really what I'm doing. I'm arriving on a story and saying, you've probably already heard about this, but if you're feeling confused by some elements of it, or you quite reasonably not managed to keep up with every twist and turn, if you watch for five minutes, let me take you through it. So that was really aimed at people who would be aware of the news, but perhaps were looking for something different in terms of how the how journalism responded to it. And I should say, I see my videos as a compliment to all the other types of journalism. I'm not trying to, I don't feel like I'm in competition with them. But, but certainly there was, I felt there was an audience appetite for something which took people from the beginning of a story or issue all the way through to the end. And so that was what I had in mind. You're right, though. News avoidance is a is a huge issue. If you talk to the heads of any big news organization or, frankly, medium or small news organization, they'll tell you, if you said to them, you know, who are your rivals or what's the main competition that you see at the moment? They'll, of course, list some other news organizations, but all of them will say news avoidance is, a, is an issue. And I think that, you know, journalism certainly and always has had to stop and consider well, how our general purpose as journalists hasn't changed. We want to tell you what's happened in the world. We want to explain it. We want to hold people to account. We want to analyze how issues and stories fit together. Journalists have been trying to do that since there have been journalists. We always need to stop and think, is the way our journalism is manifesting itself right for the people that we're trying to reach? The, the formats our journalism take shouldn't be fixed at all. They should be something that we're constantly appraising. And with the issue of news avoidance, which is undeniable, it's definitely in my mind all the time that you need to think about what form is your journalism taking to make sure that it's working for people, that it fits into their fits into their lives. And so I wouldn't presume to, to say that our explainer format is is a solution to what is a, a, a bigger and wider problem for our industry. But it is certainly me, the consequence of me in, back in 2019 was when I first started thinking about them, stopping and thinking, okay, the way I'm doing my journalism at the moment, 
is working very well on the TV, I hope, but it's not working as well as I'd like it to in the digital arena. And that's my problem, not the audience's problem. So what am I going to do about it? And this was my this was my response to it. And the, the final thing I would say is that it seems to have been popular and, and useful to people, which, you know, of course, we're delighted about. But that doesn't mean it's going to carry on being popular and useful to people. It might be that something that has worked for people for the last four years might work for a couple of years more. And then we need to come back again and reimagine it. And that constant stopping and checking and saying my journalistic purpose stays the same always, but the way it manifests itself can change. That's kind of ongoing. I never stop really questioning whether I'm doing the whether the, t- the the form of my journalism is the right thing for the situation I'm in. And often I'll conclude, no, it's not quite right. And we'll try and evolve it or come up with something new. There's a description, which I don't think it's a phrase that you, that you coined, but someone else did, which is assertive impartiality, which you, you talk a little bit about in, in, in the book. Some people might see that as bias, but that's not what it means. No, it's not about bias at all. What it is, is that if you go back into the middle of the 2010s, particularly in the run up to the 2016 US election, you had Donald Trump, who was a politician like no other that we had covered, who was routinely saying things that were demonstrably not true. And Donald Trump demanded of all journalists that they reevaluate the language that they use to describe the statements of of politicians, because some of the things that he was saying were so far over the line, was so disconnected from any available evidence um, that that we needed new phrases, we need new new language to describe what was happening. And I think it prompted a broader consideration of the language of how we handle the issue of evidence and truth, uh, both when we're assessing the statements of politicians and lots of other people besides. And I felt when I was thinking this through in 2019, that that I could be more direct in the language I was using around the evidence I had and how that how that sat alongside some of the statements of the people that we were covering. And I started to experiment with that, needless to say, talking all the time with my editors. I never, ever wanted to risk Because being impartial, which, of course, is something I deeply believe in, isn't just about being impartial. It's also about making sure you don't risk seeming partial. So it's not just about what you're doing. It's about how you're perceived to be behaving. So we were incredibly careful that the language we used never risked creating an impression of being uh, anything other than impartial. But within that, I was also interested in, can I be more blunt? Can I be more direct? about how I describe how the evidence matches, the available evidence matches what we're being told. And people noticed a shift in the language I was using, and a lot of people seemed to like it. And that became known as assertive impartiality. And I think it's a a reasonable phrase to describe what I'm trying to do. I'm asserting the evidence. I'm asserting what we can say is true, what we know isn't true, and what we can't tell you because we don't have sufficient evidence to judge. Um, But it's never about bias. My commitment is always to being fair and accurate and comprehensive. Um, That's the only outcome I'm pursuing. Um, Another phrase that you use in the book is that you enthusiastically embrace your lack of understanding. Yes. Which I, I I really liked. Um, because I think a lot of people perhaps come at a subject and think, I don't know anything about this. I, I'm perhaps bluffing. So when you say you enthusiastically embrace your lack of understanding, is that about a recognition that I want to know more about this? I need to know more about this in order for me to be credible about a particular subject. And again, this is something you can apply in journalism, but could apply to so many other different subjects as well. It's definitely about that. I'm hypersensitized to my lack of understanding, which, believe me, is uh, multifaceted on a range of subjects. Um, the reason is, if you don't understand something, you are not going to explain it and you're not going to communicate clearly and confidently on it. I'm absolutely certain of this, having tried to do it many times and it not having worked. And over the years, I've worked out that one of the best routes to being really clear and confident when I'm communicating on a subject, whether it's journalism or otherwise, is to address the things that I'm not sure about. And there's two reasons for that. The first one is obvious. If you haven't understood it, if that subject comes up, you're not going to speak clearly and confidently about it because you don't understand it. So 
clearly addressing that is a step in the right direction. But also, if you are aware that you're going to be speaking across a broader subject, but within it, there are a couple of areas you're not confident in, and you're just kind of thinking it's going to come up at some point, and when it comes up, I'm not quite sure, it can undermine how you feel about how you're talking across the entire subject. So for me, being sensitized to what I don't understand serves two purposes. It helps me resolve the lack of understanding, which means if it comes up, I speak better about it. And it also makes me feel more confident in my ability generally to take on the whole subject. So yes, I mean, that that's something. And also because I'm a generalist and I make videos and reports about any number of different subjects, my job is to get myself to a level of understanding where I can explain it but not unreasonably, all generalists, we can't be expert in everything. It would be impossible. So, so I'm quite comfortable with, with admitting things I, I don't know. And, you know, one of the things I always try and do when we're making reports is I either make a list in my head or sometimes I'll actually write it down and I'll say, what are all the things I don't understand about this? And then I'll make another list and I'll think, what are the things I think the audience won't understand about this? And obviously there'll sometimes be overlap. But if you can check off, the fact that you have understood and explained all the things you didn't understand and all the things you think the audience may not understand, your chances of making a confident, helpful, relevant piece of communication, whether it's a news report or otherwise, goes through the roof. So, yeah, I'm, I, I watch out for this an awful lot. And then one other thing I might mention on this, because it's, again, a lesson I've learned the hard way, When I spot that I don't understand something, I'll seek out someone who can help or I'll look it up online. And let's imagine I find someone who can help or an article that explains my answer. And I write some notes and, okay, so I've I've, I've got my head around the issue. If I just stop there, that's not enough for me to communicate clearly on it. The next step is I need to verbalize it. So even if I've got to the point that I've spotted the thing I don't understand and I've helped myself understand it, The third part of the equation is I need to say it out loud. And this is a lesson I've learned the hard way, but also the lesson I've learned, uh, you know, in a more positive, in a more positive way, which is that let's take an example. I was down in Downing Street a lot last summer when um, Boris Johnson was under a lot of pressure. And I might have already thought, okay, there was part of a process I didn't understand. Now I, I found out the information and I do understand it. But I'd often be standing next to a colleague like, Rob Watson, who's a brilliant political correspondent of ours. And I'd say, Rob, if I describe this part of the process this way, does that capture it? And Rob might go, yeah, you've got it. That's great. Or he might go, actually, it's a little bit more like this. So I then say it back to him and I say, so if I describe it this way, would that work? And he'd go, okay, you've got it this time. And the process of actually using the information, of of actually speaking it out loud, is a really brilliant way of of taking the understanding that you've got and translating it into phrases and words and sentences that you feel confident using. So constant velocity is another phrase that you use. And hopefully we've maintained constant velocity through the <laughs> we definitely have. Of, of the chat that we've, we've we've had, Ross. How important do you think that is, though, in journalism, that the, the, the elements of the story are there and people are engaged all the way through from start to finish, no drop off in the middle? Well, of course. I mean, the 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 lesson I the lesson again. This might seem like an obvious thing to say, but the lesson I learned when I started out as a BBC World Service radio presenter is, you know, you can have the best last twenty five percent of a story you you've ever made, but if the middle's boring and people switch off the radio, they're never going to know about that last twenty five percent. Like you have to hold people all the way through, and being really strict about the fact that you're maintaining a level of engagement and that you're maintaining a level of relevance in the information that you're passing on that you can hold people is absolutely vital. And being strict about that and being disciplined about that in journalism and in lots of other forms of communication is absolutely key. I mean, I tell a story, I think, in the book about a video that we were making about uh, Donald Trump and Afghanistan, and we'd made the video I think we'd made the video. We'd certainly, yeah, we had made the video. And after the event, one of my editors, Andrew, came over and he was like, there's a middle section that I just don't think is, just don't think it's good enough, basically. It's not that it's terrible. I just don't think it's good enough that people will get through it. And me and another colleague, Tom, who had been working on it all day, were quite wedded to this middle section. 
And we were like, nah, da, da. And then, and then we kind of toot and froed it for 15 minutes. And then we watched it back one more time. And, and you know, Andrew was just right. The middle section wasn't good enough. And it was a threat to people making it to the later section, which we were much more happy with. And so we took it out. And of course, that can that can hurt if you spent a while working on something, whether as a journalist or something else. But the prize, which is people consuming the whole thing, is much bigger than the hurt of taking something out that you've that you've worked on. So being really strict about is what I've got every step of the way, whether it's a story or another piece of communication, every step of the way, do I keep people? Is it still relevant? Am I explaining why it matters? Is it consumable? Is the information clearly set out? All of these things need to apply to every section because my experience with stories, and I'm sure it's the same in lots of other forms of communication, is that it's only as good as the weakest link. And if there's a weak link in the middle, that can be a big problem. Um, Ross, I think we could chat all day. Um, I really enjoyed the book. <laughs> Thank um, you. you. You grabbed me very early on with your story about the job interview that you went to, um, which really resonated with me because I had a very, very similar horrible job interview experience about 30 years ago, ironically enough, with the BBC. But then, anyway, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a story for, for, for another day. No, I, I, I felt your pain as I sat there halfway through my first um, uh, answer to my first question thinking, this is not going well, and then had 40 minutes of pain um, directly afterwards. So it really resonated with me. There's lots of great advice and uh, and, uh, and and tips within the book itself. So thank so you. I really enjoyed that. But there's a final question I ask everyone in the podcast, uh, so I will ask you, which is, what is it, if anything, that keeps you up at night? So in a work context, the thing that always keeps me up at night, it's twofold. It's, have I been factually correct? And have I been fair? We spend so, so long on our videos and our programming, making sure that we are fair and that we are factually correct. And uh, if there's even a 0.001% chance that, that I think that something that we're about to release isn't quite right, I'll fret about it and then I'll go in the next day and we'll we'll look at it. And often, almost always, there isn't a reason for concern because we're we're very 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 diligent about this, but that would be the one that that would keep me up at night because my reputation and the BBC's reputation is rests on being factual and being fair. We take it unbelievably seriously, and of course we would never deliberately not be those things. But when you're building a story up. These are sometimes very, not with factual stuff, but being fair is a, there's no rule book on being fair. It's an assessment. And so uh, that is something that I think about an awful lot. Um, and, you know, like with any aspect of, of uh, journalism, but especially in this area, I um, I always ask, for, you probably notice I do this a lot and I've mentioned it in the book a lot. I always ask for advice. I always, always, always ask for advice. And if in doubt, we don't. But that's something I think about. That's that's something it's it's unbelievably important to me and my colleagues that we get that right. And um, sometimes these are delicate decisions and we take them seriously and I could definitely lose sleep over those. Being fair and factual, great advice for any journalist, of course. Thanks to Roz for joining us on the podcast with some really fascinating thoughts on a lot of topics. What did you think? Join in the conversation online through the various avid social channels or with me, Craig, AW1969, on both X and Instagram. You can always email us, of course. We are making the media at avid.com. Now, check out the show notes for a podcast episode with the head of regions at Channel 4 News in the UK discussing their use of data journalism. And you can also read a blog about some recent innovations from Avid in the news space. That's all from us for now. Thanks again to Roz. Thanks to Matt Diggs, our producer. And thanks to you for listening. Join us next time for more in-depth discussion of the topics that matter to the people making the media. Music